I'm Bob Becker, director of the Strom Thurmond Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Calhoun Lecture Series. Uh, like all the lecture series, uh, like all the lectures in the Calhoun series, they're made possible by the generosity of the patrons of the lecture series and this year's co-chairs, Dot and Bruce Yandel. So please, uh, a, welcome, uh, a thank you hand for them. Uh, following uh, the presentation by our speaker, Ted Abernathy, we're going to be having a, a, a brief discussion group, uh, and the, the, the discussion group is going to feature two well-known figures on campus, Karen St. John, and Karen is the uh, director uh, of the Spiro uh, Institute on Le Entrepreneurial Leadership, and she's also the associate dean for research and graduate studies in the College of Be Business and Behavioral Sciences. Karen, I can't see you, but I know you're out there somewhere. Thank you very much. And Donna London, and Donna serves at the Institute as a senior research associate, and she's director of the Jim Self Center on the Future, and has been very involved with some of the work of the Southern Growth Policies Board. So we're delighted, Donna, that you could make it also for this session this evening, and thank you. Now, for those of us who are policy junkies and really try to keep up with what's going on, the group Southern Growth Policies Board is very familiar to most of us. Uh, they're, they're their a website is southern.org, and anytime I need to know how that this region compares, how it's moving, how it's changing, the dynamics of the region, they're the most reliable source and have been that way for a long time. I've personally been involved with them for about 25 years, and I remember the first report that they put out that really struck me as, as having a great deal to say about what it means to be a region rather than just a state or rather than just a community. And it was a report called Halfway Home, A Long Way to Go. Uh, and it, it framed what was then a vision for the future that came out of the mid-80s. And when you look back at that report and then you look at what's happened today, 20-some uh, years later, it's uncanny how tight a match that, that idea, the, the ideas generated in that report have actually come, come about. The idea that a region is a very dynamic economic engine. And so we were thrilled when Ted Abernathy agreed to come down and give this lecture. And Ted was born and raised in Dallas, the one north of us in North Carolina, and received his bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his master's degree from Johns Hopkins. He also graduated from the Economic Development Institute at the University of Oklahoma. He's an Eisenhower Fellow for Global Economics. In his 29 plus years of, of work, Ted has focused on strategic competitiveness and that economic positioning that we call comparative advantage. Ted spent the first 10 years of his career in Maryland, and he's worked in the Research Triangle region of North Carolina since 1990. And from 2000 to 2008, he served as Executive Vice President and COO for the, regional tri for the Research tri Triangle Regional Partnership. He currently serves as Executive Director of the Southern Growth Policies Board, which is a policy think tank which, many, which all our states are members of and have actually signed agreements by the governors to, to operate as that board. So without further uh, ado, please welcome Ted Abernathy. Ted. I'm really sorry I don't have the voice that comes out from the top here that talks about performers. That's kind of intimidating if you're backstage and you hear that come out and, and do that. Uh, first, thank you very much for inviting me down today. I told the group out front that I only ever come here when my Tar Heels are getting beat really bad by the Clemson Tigers, and so it's really a, a better time to come. Uh, what I want to do tonight is talk about uh, a way of thinking about the future. We, uh, we tend to think about these big issues that are changing our lives, technology, environmentalism, globalization, urbanization, and I, I want to discuss with you today that I think those are the easy things, that they've been coming at us for a very long time, and they're easy to figure out where we're headed, that there are other issues that we ought to be thinking about. Now, most of the time people get up here, and I looked at all the old other speakers who have done these series, and I'm, I'm pretty intimidated by them because they get up and they inform you with some, you know, they were, they're experts in their field, they persuade you to something, or they entertain you, and there's been a lot of fun entertainment people come up. I'm not actually here to do any of that tonight. 
I only have one goal, and that's to cause an action out of you tonight. And that action is for you to think. I really would like for tomorrow you to be thinking about some of the things that we talked about tonight. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I don't think anybody does. But I hope that tomorrow you're thinking more about some of the issues. Now, let's see here. We have a schism between North Carolina and South Carolina technology, I think. The world is changing. It's rapidly changing, actually. You know, in just a hundred years ago, the person born expected to live to be 47 years old. Today, 76, the college students in the room will expect to live to be close to 90. Their children, over 100. So that's a real difference, maybe one of the most qualitative differences that we talk about. In 1900, only 6% of married women worked. By 2000, 62% of married women work. And that changed our entire social fabric. It changed how we raised families, it changed how children worked, it changed how homes worked. In 1950, most of the people who were older had dropped out of high school. My grandparents went through about the sixth grade. My parents got to high school. They insisted I go to college. Today, people 55 and older, most have attended college. So we've become, we've lived longer, women are working, we're more educated. We're also in a global world where 80% of our middle income people are living in countries that we didn't even consider developed a few years ago. People all over the world are connected with handheld devices. I spoke to a group earlier this morning and I challenged how many of you were actually looking at them this moment. And so there's a couple of college students in the back row that are sitting there texting right now. And that's okay, I don't mind that because you're probably solving the problems of the world. 100 years ago, marijuana, heroin, and morphine were over the counter. Coca-Cola had uh, cocaine in it and iced tea hadn't been invented yet. And that's really a shame. And there were 230 murders in 1900 in the whole country. And only 14% of households had a bathtub. So we have been changing rapidly. The future, how many people in the room, and I won't be able to see your hands, but I want you to think, how many people recognize the house of Tomorrowland that was at Disneyland? When I was a seven-year-old child, I went to see that house. It was put up in Disneyland in 1957. It was taken down in 1967 because all the things in it had already happened. Disney thought it was gonna be there for 50 years. It had flat screen TVs, open concept living rooms. You know, the kitchen opened up in the living room. Nobody ever seen that, that's really interesting. It was, had plastics in it. The floors were made of wood, not other things. It was really a different house, but mo things moved so fast that it was obsolete in no time. There are a bunch of trends that we're sure of in the world. We're living a lot longer. That's the trend, and as you can see, the trend goes up fairly rapidly in the recent years. There's a whole bunch more of us in the world. For thousands of years, there were less than a billion of us. In the last 200 years, we've added five billion more to the planet. In the United States, we have fewer children. Think about how many children your parents had, how many children you had, how many children, if y'all are younger, you think you'll have, and the numbers are dropping dramatically. There's just fewer people, the fewer people having more children these days. And this is true everywhere in the world except Africa now. It's true in Europe and Asia. And so our families are much smaller. Those are the fertility rates. The blue are the lowest. And you can see Africa is sort of the odd place out of this. Women went to work. Some of you may have seen the article yesterday that now more than a third of the women where husbands and wives work make more than their husband. The projection is very soon it'll be half. So the odds of a wife making more than her husband are about 50-50. Incomes have been rising in the U.S., but mostly due to women's gains. They're the green line up there. Men's incomes have been stagnant now for about 30 years. And in the U.S., we're safer than we've ever been. Now, some of you are just, some of you just went, okay, now I know he's not telling the truth up here. These are crimes, violent crimes per thousand, and the trend has been going safer and safer. 
Now, so we're, this is my favorite guy for statistics, it's Larry the Cable Guy, and he thinks statistics are made up. And you, if you don't feel safer, two reasons. One is you might not be. This is the state-by-state -state violent crimes. And as you can see, South Carolina is above the average. So you might not be. It's a problem with averages. They take the highs and the lows. But trust me, the statistics tonight are real. Let's look at these long trajectories that I proposed to you that have been around. The urbanization, globalization, innovation, environmentalism, and mobility. You know, reality is just an illusion, Einstein said, but it's a persistent one. So the fact that they keep happening means that it's going to keep happening. Let's talk about urbanization first. We're becoming a world where people live in cities. This is the percent. In 1900, only 13% of the global population lived in urban areas. Today, it's over 50, going to 70. A clear trajectory. In the world 50 years ago, there were only 80 cities of a million people or more. Today, almost 400. By 2020, almost 1,000 cities of a million or more concentrated around the globe, mostly on coastal regions. In the United States, 80% of our population now live in metro areas. And they live in cities that are bigger. In fact, 60% of our population live in cities of a million or more. So it's nice for us to sit back and imagine that we're from that small town. And if any of you are, have ever been through Dallas, North Carolina, where I'm from, it didn't take long to go through it, and it's about the same size it was 100 years ago. But that's not what most of America is like anymore. Most of America is big cities now. That's where most people live. This is the projected density of the South. If, the, if we keep going the way we're going, the red is the most dense. That little area right there starts on the lower end with Atlanta, ends on the upper end with Raleigh, goes right through here, and that's the highest concentration of population growth in the South. Globalization. We start hearing about it. You know, most of you started hitting on your ears about, you know, 10 years ago, but you might have heard of Marco Polo or Columbus or the Silk Roads. We've been globalizing for 500 years. That's what most of the exploration was about. So globalization is not a new thing. What is new is global trade, and this is the import and export to the United States since 1950. You can see the trajectory is pretty fast. The bad news is that our imports have been growing faster than our exports, but again, a clear trajectory of globalizing. What do we expect from that globalization? Some good, some bad. This is the Black Death. That was part of globalization 800 years ago. It moved across continents, and so pandemics worry us. Smog and pollution in the world, unfortunately, don't stay inside political boundaries. They move. Lots of people disagree in this world, and so you end up with terrorism and disagreement and trade wars. And so the American version of capitalism is one version. There are many others, and some that just don't like it at all. In 1929, the bank run in the U.S. was a bad thing, but it was a U.S. thing. It impacted the world, but just a little. Well, the last one, the last bank crisis, impacted all the global markets. And we have this entertainment stuff. We think, you know, Harry Potter and all the entertainment from around the world is starting to creep in. Well, this is when I was six or seven. I mean, we've had foreign influences on our culture for a very long time. We travel, we see the world, and we can talk to anybody you want to talk to. You can talk to people in Africa. This week, we were talking to friends who were in Morocco last week. They were in mud huts, people who didn't have food, but had satellite TV watching American television. That's the world we live in today. And oh, by the way, we're competing for jobs with everybody all over the world. So let me ask you four questions, and you don't have to raise your hand because it's later in the evening, but I want you to think if you believe these. Do you believe that we're competing more now for new jobs and investment than any time in American history. Do you believe that competition is global? The hard question is, do you believe as we compete that there will be places that win who add jobs, raise incomes, raise standard of living and quality of life, and places that lose, that lose jobs, that factories shut down, that wages go down? And if you believe that, then the fourth question is, is there anything that people can do to improve their odds? And that's what people do economic development, community development, and other things for. But that third one's the hard one to wrestle with. Do we actually believe 
that there's going to be winners and losers. Because if we do, that changes the competitive nature of what we're doing. Craig Barrett said once that as a CEO of Intel, that Intel, one of the largest companies in the United States, could succeed without ever hiring another American. And there are a lot of country, companies that believe that. We'll talk more about American companies later. But the U.S. is still the largest uh, GDP. We're the largest economy by far in the world. This is our numbers compared to our friends. The next group are Japan and China and Germany. And so we are still the largest economic power in the world by a lot. When you look at competitive factors, currently we're ranked second behind Switzerland, but quite honestly, I'm not that worried about Switzerland. I know it's a good place to go, but you know, it's a little cold, not very flat, and it's not going to grow very much. But there are other people up there that are, that are competitive and difficult. When you measure it on different factors, you know, the quality of our infrastructure and our roads and our ports, we're in the teens, you know, 14, 11, 13. Primary education among the 133 countries, 30th. The percent we spend of our GDP on education, 45th. The quality of our math and science, 48th. And, you know, I, we could have a long debate about whether these measures are the right measures and who did this and whatever. The fact is, this is what people who make global decisions of where jobs and investment, this is what they believe, this is what they read. So if we want to fix it, we could fix the, the brand or the image, or we could actually fix the problem. We're also, the cost of crime on the business is 74th. The strength of our auditing and reporting, we're not the most competitive place on every factor. And we're proud Americans, and I am too, but we're in a competition, and if we want to win that competition, we have to work on the competitive issues. One of the things that might scare you is this group of countries on the left are improving rapidly. They're more competitive than ever. Now, that's Belarus and Rwanda and places that you probably don't think of as being competitive and yet direct foreign investment and new jobs and R&D centers are starting to flow to places we never thought we were competing against. Sometimes we think it's just our cost. This is the business tax rate of all taxes on business. The U.S. is over here on the left at about 40%. We're higher than Hong Kong and Singapore and Ireland and some of the tiger economies. But the last two over on the right are India and China. So we're, it's not all about money. It's not all about the taxes. We, we need to compete with everybody, so sometimes it's about that issue, but it's about a lot of different issues. And then just take home tonight and think about when you're, uh, when you're driving home, is, are we sure now, if you ask you out in the hall and without a slide up, do we want everybody in the world to have the American dream and prosper and become a middle class? And we'd say yes. Right now, by global standards, about 90% of the U.S. is already middle class. Japan, U.K., most of Europe in that same range. China's at 15%, India's at 9%. You know, that's, uh, there's a couple billion people there that could come into middle class and compete with us? And it's a question we have to ask ourselves. Innovation or technology has been coming a long time. And I just picked one, communication. I mean, we had typewriters 300 years ago, and answer, the first telephone answering machines 115 years old. I mean, motion pictures a bit. We've had technology coming for a very long time. Your parents were amazed by technology. Our kids are amazed by technology. It's not new. And so this idea that all of a sudden technology is going to change everything, technology's always been changing everything. It always does. The next generation is just something else. We had, car, we had phones in cars in the 1930s. There weren't a lot of them. They were for the very rich, and they only called one or two places, but they were there, and they were setting the trajectory. In the last 15 years, when I travel today, my little pack has my iPod and my Blackberry and the digital camera and the GPS that took me an odd way to get here, but we'll, we'll, we'll blame it, not me. But, I mean, what's tomorrow? How many people don't think that those four things are going to be one thing and it's going to be about this big and it's going to cost me about $100 and it's going to fit in my pocket and the charge is going to go forever? I mean, that's coming, so we're going to see that. The technology, if we want to know where it's going, it's pretty easy, they're going to be smaller, 
They're going to change their evolution. We're going to have a new one every six months. They're more complex. They're more customized. You can, your individual features will happen. And this idea that you'll have to plug them in anywhere or do anything tethered, all that's going away. So technology's coming, and we, we've seen that come. Environmentalism, we think, is a new thing. But we've been doing environmentalism in the United States for 100 years. And I tell the story. We had part, Teddy Roosevelt was the first environmental president. And there aren't, I don't think there's anybody in the room who voted for Teddy Roosevelt. So, I mean, it, this has been a long time coming. And I tell the story. When I was in the first grade, they gave you these little plastic bags to take home so your mom and dad would put them on the cigarette lighter of their car and put their litter in it so they wouldn't throw it out the window. I mean, you know, some of the younger people in the room go, throw it out the window. Well, that's what you did. I mean, until Lady Bird Johnson came along and said, we're going to clean up the highways and plant flowers and litter. So our kids did recycling. The current kids, the young kids today are talking about anti-idling. It's been a long way coming. And so the trajectory, I mean, we're going to be greener. We're already greener. The windows are greener. The insulation is greener. The car mileage is greener. But we're going to get power from different sources. We're going to have new building standards that green our buildings new forms of transport, everything's going to be more efficient, new materials, new per all this is just, a, it's just along a trajectory. And then mobility, everything's more mobile. People move more often, they're mobile, they'll move anywhere in the world. Capital, money, it used to be you got money from the local bank. Your local bank doesn't have any money now. It's somewhere else in New York or San Francisco or London or somewhere, and they're just a processing center. That money moves around the world at any speed it wants. Our physical infrastructure, we used to think a four-lane highway gave us economic development. Well, now it's about airplanes, and if you know, some airline company goes out of business, they take the planes away. And you had something, and now you don't. Even intellectual property. I don't want to guess how many international connections Clemson has, but dozens, if not hundreds, and our campuses all across America are opening partnerships and opening campuses all over the world, and that intellectual property is flowing everywhere. And if you don't believe that, just look at who wins national and international awards. There are always teams of a scientist from this country, and a, so mobility of that, even corporate infrastructure. Corporations are everywhere today. They're not based anywhere. They're based everywhere. So if those are the trajectories, what are the tangents? What causes us to change the position that we're in. These aren't hard either. You know all of these things. Global pandemics could change our global footprint. It certainly did in Europe 800 years ago. I mean, when the plague hit Europe, coming from Northern Africa, it changed Europe profoundly. And if we were all of a sudden to lose, in some pandemic, 20% of the population of some continent, that would profoundly change the direction of that continent. Natural disasters, <coughs> Thailand's trajectory was changed pretty bad with a tsunami, but we could have, if those three hurricanes were to hit the South China port structure and you couldn't get goods out of China for a year, how would that change the way we consumed in America? Fires, floods. I don't want to get into a long argument tonight on global climate change, pro or con, but I would say that if the, chi if the climate changes, and those port cities that you saw a million or more are all of a sudden not on land but in water, that will have a change. If it gets colder, hotter, the wind blows, the hurricanes come, all those things change things. We could also have war, which has changed the trajectory of history many times, or, my, or war in the form of terrorism. So you've got trajectories and you've got these tangents. And the last part of this I want to spend time on is choices. Some of the things aren't preordained. We already we know that there are things that are happening that are going to continue to happen. We know there are interruptions that could happen. But throughout most of American history, we've had a pie, and our choice has been, how do we divide a bigger pie? How do we take the great natural resources, the great higher education, the innovation, the entrepreneurial spirit of America in this growing pie, and how do we divide that growing pie? I hope the pie keeps growing. What if the pie gets smaller? What if the pie makes us make choices? So if we have to make choices about the economy of jobs or energy or education or leadership, and I just picked a few, let's talk about competition for a minute. And if y'all know about competition on the football field, 
This is my favorite title of a book. I don't want, the book's okay, but the title's great. Competing with everyone from everywhere for everything. And I think that we're gonna skip things tonight. Here. The US economy, for those of you who didn't read to your children, that's Eeyore. Uh, and most of the economy today is pretty sad to talk about. The good news is that the economy is pretty complicated and parts of it are better than others. We have a cyclical problem with our current economy. We also have a structural problem. The cyclical is one of these and it will come back. It's a deep one, so it'll come back slower. Structurally though, with infrastructure and education and all, we have more issues. We also have spatial issues, places that are growing, places that aren't. And then we have personal issues of inequity in our economy. So let's look at a couple of those things. Good news is projections next year are for real growth globally. That does not mean real growth in this part of South Carolina or real growth in your household. There's an old uh, saying that there's really no such thing as an unemployment rate of 6.8. It's either zero or 100. If you got a job, it's zero. If you don't have a job, it's 100%. And so this doesn't mean everything's good, but it does mean that it will start getting better over time. This is the stock market from 1990 in the United States. It's moseying along, and then you have those two look like a little bit of a camel hump over there. Anybody know what those are? Those are bubbles. And I will tell you that at least my world, my economic world says that bubbles don't exist permanently. They exist temporarily. And so we come back down. These are home prices in the US indexed. That's a 5% straight line growth of home prices. See that one hump camel in the middle? Now, I don't know if anybody here is from San Diego, but, and I'm, and I'm sorry if I'm insulting you if you are from San Diego, but if you're from San Diego and you bought a house for half a million dollars in 2002 and you thought it would be worth $3 million in 2008, then that's not the way that real value on property works. Things that go up do come down. We worry about making stuff in America. Uh, we are by far the world leader in manufacturing. We make uh, most of the world manufacturing, we're getting a smaller percentage, but for every dollar that's produced in China, we make $2.50 in the US. We don't have as many jobs in manufacturing. We tend to make large ticket items that are heavily robotic, heavily efficient, and that's why they're still made here. So we've moved up the value chain. We make more expensive, more complicated stuff. The bad news is so do a bunch of other people. In 1986, the US high-tech exports were 65 billion. Today, they're 284 billion. We've moved up. China has jumped from not being on the chart to being ahead of us, and a whole lot of Asia is right behind us. So while we've stayed in the high-tech export business and done a good job of it. We've, in, we've gained a lot of competitors across the world. And oh, by the way, on this thing, if you don't have a high school degree right now, your unemployment rate in the United States is 16%. If you have a college degree, it's 5%. This is a, an economy that is extremely punitive if you don't have enough education. So we have to set the bar higher on what we expect. Also, this has been a man's recession. The, on the left, the pie charts, we've lost million three construction jobs. 92% of those jobs were men. We've lost 1.9 million manufacturing jobs. 94% of them were men. On the right side, we've gained jobs in the health industry and in the government sector. 79% of the jobs we gained in health went to women. 94% of the government jobs went to women. There's a profound change in the economy happening in America between the relationship of men at work and men as breadwinners and women at home, and, or women as secondary breadwinners. It's one of the things that's truly changing the way we live. So we have a bunch of choices to make. Do we want to concentrate our national and our state resources into specific geographic areas or industries and make those strong? Or do we want to spread it out and accept that we'll make everybody a little stronger and they'll compete and some will win or some will lose? Can we compete with other countries that have different rules than we do? Is that fair? Is it right? Is it something we have a choice in? Should we be maximizing the US standard of living at the expense of other people? This is a moral question, and I don't have an answer for that morality question, but you know, should we subsidize certain things in America that we know will make people here wealthier, but will cause poverty in other places? Those are choices we will make that will decide our trajectory in the future. Energy, which Southern Growth spent a lot of time on last year, 
We've got a couple simple problems in energy. This is, our, this is the production of U.S. energy last year. Uh, the key number for you is that 71 quadrillion BTUs at the top. That's how much we make. And of that, 6% is renewable, most of that biofuels. The second slide is how much we use, which is 101 quadrillion. We've got a huge gap in the amount of energy we use versus what we create here. A lot of that is in transport, which is oil, but we still have a lot of issues. So this is my biggest problem. This is behind my desk. Don't laugh, y'all looks like that too. Some of you have wound the wires really nice and neat, but that's y'all's problem, not mine. All right? We want more energy. We're not going backwards on energy use. More of what we run our lives on is, is energy. So the world is growing in energy usage. That big thing right here in the middle, this is us over here. This is China's energy use. India will be right behind them. So the world's gonna need more energy. What do we do? How do we make choices about that? In the South, South Carolina is the top percentage state for nuclear. 51% or 52% of South Carolina's energy comes from nuclear. That's the highest in the South. In West Virginia, it's 98% from coal. In Florida, natural gas is the highest. Each of our states have a very different stake in the energy issue. So is the future of energy wind and sun and biofuels? Well, that's been coming for a long time too. We've been burning wood, using windmills, and heating from the sun for a very long time. The question is, can our technology make it better to do that? When I took over at Southern Growth about a year ago, we were doing energy policy, and I said, well, help me understand the issue. And they said, well, we're talking about adequate energy supply. Okay, I understand that. We want a good supply of energy at a low cost. But we need to use energy to not hurt our existing economy and create new jobs. Okay, I got that. And we want to be good environmental stewards, and we don't want to, you know, we've got, we got to save the world with this, too. Oh, and by the way, there's energy independence, and we want to make sure that we're not getting far in anything. Oh, and there's personal choice and freedom here and quality of life. We don't want to do it. By the time you start doing all of this, and you deal with all the issues associated, the last thing you talk about is energy supply. You talk about everything else, and as a society, we have to deal with all of those complex issues. And oh, by the way, our lifestyles just go the opposite way. This is the square footage of houses in America. 273 square feet per person in 1950, right at 1,000 square feet per person now. We heat it, we cool it, we build it, we insulate it. I mean, our lifestyles don't follow the rhetoric of our policy dialogues. So we have choices, again. Are we gonna change the way we live to conserve energy, or are we gonna do more of what we want? Can we invent fast enough? Can we figure out carbon capture and sequestration? Can we figure out how to drive the price down in solar energy? Can we figure out how to store battery power to change our auto fleet? How do we balance those various priorities? And there's a thousand more issues. Around talent, which is the commodity that we compete with, this is the map that shows the movement of college-educated people around the country from 1970 to 2000. What you can see in the blue areas is college-educated people congregated. So you can see the blue through the South Carolina upstate area, very strong in-migration of college graduates. You see the research triangle up above it, Florida, Texas triangle out west. But you see these huge gaps in the northeast and midwest where college-educated college people just left. So how do those places compete? All across the South, we're doing a better job of educational attainment. We're moving up, and more, people, more and more people have higher and higher education. But when we look at competitive factors around the world, we have some of the lowest number of days that we send our kids to school. We have some of the lowest hours per day that kids attend school. And if you wanna just scare yourself to death, start looking at education rigor in countries that we're competing against. We're celebrating that in eighth grade proficiency in, in science or math, we're getting to the 35th or 40th percentile. That 40, 35 or 40 percent get to proficient. I don't know what y'all's expectations are, but I can tell you business expectations is we get a lot higher. Our workforce is shrinking. We have less babies, as we said before. So our workforce, both because of that and because of bubbles, are getting less. So we are in a talent drought, which is what happened to Japan in the last decade. 
And oh, by the way, we used to attract talent from all over the world, as did Western Europe and Australia. Now that same talent's going to Eastern Europe, China, and India. College students were asked last year, where would they go for a good job? I think this would be worse this year. I'm waiting for the next one. But 37% said they'd move anywhere in the world for a good job. Our college students, this is US college students. And 70% said any city. So it's a mobility that makes places compete against each other. So we have choices. Do we want more education rigor that allows us to compete? Will we be able to continue to attract and keep? Will we start having more babies or will we start having a, more immigrants? Because to fuel the economy, we're gonna need more workers. And then last one here is leadership. When we ask what people, we do a lot of leadership work, and when we ask what people want leadership for, what they say is, we want someone to make sense of all of that stuff that Ted and others talk about, and we want them to do something about it that'll help us. Something, do, go out and do something, help us. Well, there used to be two models. There was this important person or important group model that came along, the mayor of a city, the head of the chamber of commerce, the CEO, and they would come along and they would say, here's what we ought to do, and everybody would follow. Or there was a second model that was, you know, the church group in the community or the local Rotary Club or somebody who didn't have a lot of power but had a good idea came up with something and it bubbled up. Well, neither one of those seem to be the way leadership is done today. Today, it seems to be groups of public and private and nonprofit, in fact, dozens of different groups and people, and they come together around the solution to individual problems. There's usually a catalyst, but the same people who work to get the school bond passed might not be the same people who work to get the road improved or the education built or the performing arts center funded. And so it ends up being a connection, a networked leadership of who you have connections with. Let me tell you the good news. The good news is that these college aged kids, I apologize for kids, but I have two, so it's just the way it is, that they do this better than we do. They are networked better than we are. Information changes faster, and they are more willing to, to have episodic leadership on individual projects. This person can lead this time and that person can lead the next time. So I'm, I'm optimistic about this, but I think that creates a need for us to have more and more social capital, connections with each other that allows us to work together. So if I ask you all, and I'm not going to, but if I ask you to stand up and shake hands, that'd be pretty easy. But if I ask you to give the guy next to you or the lady next to you $500, you'd want to have a little social capital there before you did it because you wouldn't know who to trust. Well, in our societies today, I don't know what a community is anymore. And this is one of those things I actually spend time thinking about, that is a community the neighborhood? Is it the town? Is a community your Facebook group? Is a community your group of friends who work on something? Is it geographic at all? I mean, I don't know, but I do know that we need connectivity in order to make adequate choices. When you ask Americans, who do they trust? Well, they trust doctors and teachers and scientists. Uh, only 66% trust ordinary people, but they don't trust Congress. They don't trust lawyers. They don't trust the press. They don't trust actors. I don't know why you would, but they don't trust actors. So this trust issue, we have a real uh, conundrum trying to figure out if we're going to have a network leadership, who do we trust? Bill Bishop's book, which is one of the last best books I've read called The Big Sort, says that we are sorting ourselves now, our politics, our markets, our culture, into more and more segmentation. The argument is that we spend more and more of our lives with people who are just like us, who think like us, because we don't want to talk to people who don't agree with us. So think about the last time you had a really hard discussion with someone you didn't agree with, as opposed to talking to people that you agree with completely. And y'all just keep talking about the same thing over and over, and you agree with each other, and you just keep reinforcing it. You listen to the same media people that agree with you. You read the same papers and books that people who agree with you. Because Americans, while we score pretty high in our ability to, in our willingness to talk about issues, we score very low in our will willingness to talk about issues with anybody who disagrees with us. We don't like confrontation. And we're held together with this sort of interesting notion of being Americans. 
And I'm very proud American. We, we showed up here in the 1600s as indentured servants in Jamestown, my family. But I don't know what makes a company American anymore. Is McDonald's or Coca-Cola that has 80% of their business and employees and profits offshore, are they American companies? Does it actually matter where their home base is? And if they move it tomorrow, would Coke be less of an American company? What makes a product American? If a Ford Focus has 80% of its parts made in other countries, is it more American than a Toyota Camry that has 80% of its parts made in the U.S.? I don't know. I mean, we can have a good debate about it, but I don't know. What makes a person American? You know, is a person who gets naturalized tomorrow, do you think of them as the same American as someone who's been here for five generations? And again, I mentioned what's community. What's the American dream? Now, will you, all of you do that quick Norman Rockwell thing in your head. What's the American dream? Well, today, only 27% of Americans say it involves marriage. 29% say a career. Now, if you jump down to the bottom, 66% say financial security, but, they, but young people don't see careers anymore. They certainly don't see careers in one place. They change jobs, people in America, all people in America, change jobs every 3.6 years. A 30-year-old has probably had nine jobs before they turn 30. They don't see the, so, you know, they, they, want, they want family in some way, they want children, but not necessarily marriage. And even home ownership. We even have commercials that talk about the American dream of home ownership. Only a third of the people see home ownership as even being part of the American dream anymore. So we again have choices. Are we going to continue to make choices through greater consensus? Are we going to learn to actually have civil dialogues about hard issues that we don't agree with? Or are we just going to keep fragmenting? Are we going to have that fragmented acquiescence? Are we going to go live in places that think like us? Eventually, are we going to live in states that have laws that are the laws we support? So if we like gambling, are we going to go to Vegas? If we like legalized marijuana or euthanasia, pick whatever topic. Are we going to get narrower and narrower, and narrower so that parts of South Carolina are where the people who believe this live and other parts are where the people who believe that? Are, are we going to let those things that divide us actually divide us? <coughs> And there are a lot of people who think that the current model, we watch in Europe have this model of trying to get together, but they don't actually agree on much. Are we going to let inertia determine our future? We've been trying to have tax reform in southern states for 70 years. I mean, we've gone back and forth forever on tax reform. Every, if you go to every legislature and every governor, they know that the current system's all screwed up. Are we gonna have health reform? Everybody agrees it's broke. We don't agree at all on how to fix it. Are we going to just let it go and let inertia decide it? And are our choices about these small geographies, are they big? Are we going to make it for South Carolina? Are we going to make it for Clemson? Are we going to make it for the South, the United States, North America, or the world? We have choices that will determine our future. So even those trajectories I talked about before are creating all sorts of conundrums. If we have urbanization, what happens to our rural towns? What happens to that small town that I grew up in? If we're going to have globalization, we know that people are going to win. There are some of you in this room who export products or import products lower who make money on globalization. And there are others, everyone in this room probably knows someone who lost their job because of it. Innovation, we keep saying in economic development, innovation is the key, and it is. Companies have to innovate or die. Every time almost that you innovate, something dies. Something <laughs> is no longer there. And then finally, education. It's nice to talk about having everybody with a college education. Who's going to do the other stuff if we all have college educations? So there are big conundrums that we have choices about. The future I feel pretty certain about, last two slides, is that we're going to have more competition, more outsourcing, more rapid transformation. The speed of change that make all of us crazy is going to get worse. And there's not going to be geographic loyalty of companies, I don't think, of people. Definite speed, 24-7. The world that where work was separate is gone. Work is into our lives 24-7. And our lives are now cycles. There's a book called Cycles by Mary Dashwal, who we used to do the, you know, educate for 12 or 16 years, work for 40, retire for 20, die. And now it's educate for some period of time, 
take a sabbatical, go to Europe, work for 10 years, go back and get more education, work for a while longer, take another sabbatical, go to Asia. The cycles are all different, and so the way we live is different. We're gonna have higher skilled, diversified workforce agility, and the retraining capacity and the intellectual agility of this person is going to be what makes he or she competitive. Are we able to relearn and continues to learn all the time? Global supply chains are here to stay. Get, everybody should get used to them. Knowledge networks, collaborations between people all over the world, instantaneous. And then a dependence on technology is here. It, all, it has been. We were depend, I mean, the cotton gin was a dependence on technology. Well, now it's a personal commitment and a personal dependence. And then I think these collaborative leadership models are things we need to get used to. I think when we go out, we're not going to be able to say, that's the answer, I want you to do that. We're going to have to work in collaborative models. And I'm going to bop the cats. I really wish y'all could see this, but you know, something about the technology. Southern growth has been around for about 40 years. We try to help people deal with some of these issues. Last year it was energy. This year we're working on economic recovery. And so we work with your states, but we also work with communities, cities, counties, regions across the state. Look for our reports at southern.org. We try to have some answers to help people, but again, we try to make sure that people are dealing in, in numbers and cal southern calculations that make sense. Y'all can come on up. And conversations that are civil and productive and in collaborations that move things forward. And uh, it's been an exciting year for me at Southern Growth, and I hope it, hope it stays that way for the coming future. But I can tell you that some days it's depressing because there are so many tough issues. And other days, because I get to spend a lot of time out in southern communities, it's really exciting to see how much good work and how hard people are working to try to make a difference in their lives. I thank you very much for inviting me today, and I think we're going to answer some questions over here. Thank you. Could you do that one more time? Yeah. You gave us way too much to think about. And, and, and I apologize for that, but no, I no, did no, say no. that was the goal. And you did a wonderful job with that. Thank you so much. And, and with that, Karen, maybe you could start with the first question. I'd oh, be happy to. Holy cow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> My first question relates to a concept that is talked about in the economic development community. And um, I'm just curious, are you, I'm sure, familiar with the idea of a cluster? Sure. Um, yeah. What would be your definition of a cluster, and do you think that makes sense? as a focal point for economic development in a yeah. community. Now, I actually had the privilege of working on the cluster strategies for the Research Triangle. Uh, a cluster is a group of organizations, private, nonprofit, and education that work together to support a concentrated industry. That industry is not necessarily hard line. So uh, a biotech cluster might include feedstocks, it might include universities, but uh, a cluster is the the group of activities you need to bring together to strengthen a group of businesses. Uh, they do make sense. Uh, there are certainly many examples. In, in the upstate here, you have an automotive cluster built around a single industry that's beginning to spread. Uh, in the triangle where we, where we live, we have both uh, clusters around higher tech electronics, uh, gaming, and also biotech. And they're, they're spread out across the south. Uh, and, and the world. I, I think that it's a good process. I do think that as we become more mobile that we have to look at clusters in a broader range and you may not have all the pieces in your geographic community but you need to connect them uh, around the world. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of them but not with a closed hard line yes. around political boundaries because okay. I don't think they work that way. Okay. If you're looking at the automotive cluster, the automotive cluster right now is a southern cluster not a South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky. All of those have parts of it, but they need to be working closer together. Okay, okay. great. Southern Growth Policies Board has recently spoken, and, and for years really has spoken about the Old South and the New South. Given the changes that you just mentioned and um, also uh, that they are occurring at such an accelerated uh, pace, what do you see as the implications for the cities of the New South and the rural areas of the Old South. Yeah, I think I think the, the let's do the depressing ones first. The implications for rural areas in the world is that without some uh, niche to be competitive, that they're not competitive with urban areas. When I say that coming from a rural area, um, they don't have the university structure usually. Now, if you're in a 
rural area like this, then you've got that niche and that ace to play. You don't have the global airports, you don't have the mobile capital and stuff. So it's much harder to be competitive in rural areas and I think they will find new niches to be part of. Southern cities is an interesting concept. I, I invite everybody here to think about your favorite southern city of over 200,000. Now, my bet is that I could write five or six down on a piece of paper and get them all in the room because we don't tend to think about ourselves as city. Our, our southern heritage is about small towns. You know, if you, you know, and, and a bunch of you, I can almost see your hand. How many of you thought of Charleston? And raise your hand. Okay, so I got about a third of the room on the first shot there. I mean, Charleston's a great city, and it's a port city, and it's an old city that had its niche, you know, in 1600 and something. So it has always been there, and it's had a, a lifestyle around it. Anybody say Charlotte? I grew up in the Charlotte area. Charlotte is a new city. I mean, really, when I was growing up, there were six movie theaters in Charlotte and one Chinese restaurant, and it, you know, that, it, wasn't, it wasn't a mega city. Neither was Nashville, and Nashville's a lot of people's favorite cities in the South. I think southern cities are gonna grow very differently, and depends on where they are and what their concentrations are, but I think that we have a lot of policy issues in the South to deal with around urban areas. We don't think urbanly at our legislators. Our governors tend not to be urban governors. They tend to be rural governors. And I do think our cities are gonna to have to compete globally for jobs and investment and branding. And I think that it's gonna take more work at our, uh, at our legislative levels, at our governor's levels. And also, it's gonna take our universities to start seeing us as more urban in some of the things we deal with. Northeast suffers the opposite way. They, are, they think of themselves completely as urban and many areas are suburban in nature and they, they're having trouble adopting too. So I think there's public policy issues on both sides. Uh, and I will say on the old and new South issue, and as I get older, the old South looks further away. So <laughs> I, but uh, I think that we have been a aging South, maturing South, if you would, for a very long time and have changed a lot. And yet at the same time, when I travel the South, I see a lot of things that look very familiar to me. I mean, they, 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 they seem familiar. And so I don't think that we're losing much of our cultural history. I think we're doing a pretty good job of that, but we haven't figured out what our future is yet. And there's a lot of work to be doing. You, you, you know, the running running uh, programs on trying to help people see their future, those choices are hard to make. I have a question about one of the slides that you showed. You showed um, projections for 2030 mm -hmm. that showed this very dense population growth between Atlanta and, and the uh, Raleigh-Durham area coming right through this area. Mm -hmm. How much of that is related to uh, Interstate 85? A, a ton of it. A ton yeah. of it? Yeah. And how much can this area influence? Is there a way that we might drop the ball so that that doesn't happen, that growth doesn't occur? Uh, sure, you, you could choose, first of all, mm -hmm. not to allow it to be part. You know, right. There are, uh, in the research triangle, which has grown quite rapidly over the years, uh, we, the triangle, I, and I, I have a set of slides that show the metropolitan areas of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. And at one time, uh, Wake County, which is where Raleigh was, was about 40% of the population of the region. Well, it's now close to 70% of the population of the region. It's grown at a much faster rate than Chapel Hill. But Chapel Hill's chosen to grow slower. Other communities have not chosen to invest in their schools or their other things, and they've grown even though they slower even though they wanted to grow faster. The, the 85 quarter is a huge part of connecting the South this way. And many of you might notice the 95 quarter doesn't actually work this way. I mean, this is the industrial quarter through the South, being close to 85, sort of 25, 30 miles either way is, uh, is the area most people think is the top growth. That slide is built off a projection of the growth from 1970 to, to 1990 into 95, and what would happen if we keep growing that way. So. Uh, the future is not cast, but it is uh, what I think most of the infrastructure is in place to allow that to happen. And related to that, because it, uh, so much of that projection would have been tied to manufacturing, possibly relocating to the south from the northeast. And are we seeing that phenomenon any longer? Should we, I would, I would anticipate that that trend has changed. Uh, we're seeing business movement to the south still. It's still the number one preference. What you saw in the uh, early part of this century uh, through 2000 through about 2008 
was more corporate relocations, uh, especially into Charlotte, Atlanta, Nashville, some of the bigger cities. You also saw a, a fair number of back office data centers, financial services. I think that, uh, that you'll see some retrenching of that. I think that there are some northeastern cities especially, and a few midwestern that are trying to make a comeback. But uh, we, we like to talk a lot about sustainable communities, and I'm not talking about the built environment here, I'm talking about the economic environment. We tend to have disposable or consumed communities. You, you take on enough debt, you build enough stuff, you make things so expensive that eventually companies being mobile just pick up and move. And you're left with that. And I think there, there are a lot of places in the Northeast and the Midwest that can't come back because they're uh, encumbered with way too much baggage. But the South, most Southern cities haven't gotten there yet. And so we'll, I think we'll continue to grow for quite some time, especially now that uh, some of the Western fast growth cities in Nevada and Arizona are having, they're having more water issues, they're having housing issues. Uh, the South's looking pretty strong. Uh, Ted, most of what we learn and know today won't be any good tomorrow, possibly, right. or in a few years down the road. So how then should we be educating our workforce, both our young people as well as our mature uh, worker? Uh, continuously is the answer. Uh, you know, it, it is a somewhat daunting idea that you're going to have to re-educate yourself sort of <laughs> all the time for the rest of your life. Uh, there are people that we all know who are proud they haven't read a book since, you know, 1983. And, you know, well, we don't do that. And, I, you know, I, and I'm not going back to community college or I'm not going back to get a second degree or I'm not doing in uh, service. It, uh, uh, most of the training in America takes place at the workplace. Uh, but we need to understand that the skill sets that we have today, and there's, there's a bunch of studies out that say that you know, college freshmen in technology fields, by the time they get to be seniors, you know, all the stuff their freshman year is worthless. I, mean, I, I don't know. I, my guess is the professor is still teaching that, so I, I, don't think, I don't think that's true. But I do think that the expansion of knowledge is moving so fast that uh, the question is, how specialized can we be? I mean, how, there's no way that we have the capacity to absorb all that we need to absorb. So are we going to be able to work in teams that allow us to have common knowledge, but at the same time we keep moving forward? Uh, we should be uh, doing more at each level. I mean, we, we have a, a limited number of skilled workers in America in almost every level. That includes everything from the, you know, the standard, we don't have enough welders and plumbers and you know, skilled workers that way, uh, all the way up to we don't have near enough engineers and scientists. So I think that it's across the board, but the real question for universities and high schools and others is, when is the education system going to react and change the way that we deliver education? Because the consumer is going to change the way they consume it, whether or not we change to react to that. Somebody will fill that gap. And I think that's a real challenge, both for K-12 education, but also especially for community colleges and colleges. And we're doing a ton of things already, but I think there's gonna be a real change on how the consumer wants to be educated. And they're gonna demand that change. And they'll get it from somebody, whether that's the company or you know, the ABC Acme Online Here I Do Re-Educating You program, but somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna be there to fill it in. But it, there needs to be change and it needs to be Consumer driven needs to be 24 7 on time, on demand, self, -pay, you know, all those things. And we'll get there real soon. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the most profound thing to change education in the last hundred years is how fast that all of a sudden comes around a corner and is staring us in our face. Yeah, it is amazing what you're seeing in terms of online education and, and um, notable programs doing that as well. I think we've got a, a time for a couple more questions if you. Along the same lines of uh, workforce and, and having a ready workforce for the, for the next generation, what role does immigration play in this? And what role has it played in the, in the southern states? Um, long topic. Uh, in, immigration has always backfilled our, our education and lower end workforce needs in America. Yes. Always has. Uh, educa the educational level of new immigrants tends to start rising in second and third generations. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those big choices we have as a society as to what do we want, do we want to have, it's, it, immigration's one of those stick your head in the sand policies. We've never dealt with it straight up that 
you have to have an, a certain number of workers in. You really want to regulate those, so you want to have borders that you control. You want to have enough educated H-1 visa people to come in to fill the slots you need. I mean, if you look at immigration today and look at the top 20 fast growth high tech companies in America, half of them were started by immigrants, uh, in, including in town. I mean, you know, so we've always been a place where the best and brightest came to realize their dreams. And so we have to do that at the same time we have to backfill. That doesn't mean that you should have an open border with ill. It, it means that you need a policy that recognizes there's an economic issue along with other issues. And uh, so immigration will play a role in that. And it, uh, as a society, at some point, we just have to decide that we're actually going to be proactive about the policies rather than, I would say, reactive, except not active would be a more appropriate way of putting it. Uh, and that's true, again, as I said, on many of our issues. It's much easier since we can't reach a consensus because we don't like to, you know, there, there's not a great answer. You know, we don't have great answers. If we had a great answer, we'd say, aha, we've got it. Let's go, you know, move forward on health care and social security. And, you know, I mean, we'd do that. But those aren't coming along. And so immigration is one of those really tough ones, harder in some places than others. And um, we've seen the, since the economic downturn, we've seen a, an exodus of a lot of uh, especially illegal immigrants or non-documented immigrants in the U.S. That changes, it's just one of those things, this economy changed the trajectory. So we've got some time probably to be able to deal with the problem. You talked about the work that Southern Growth has been doing in terms of energy. What sort of opportunities and challenges do you see for Southern cities, um, and uh, particularly on the job front? Yeah, let me, on energy, there's a couple things about the South that are just different. One of them being it's hot. You know, I mean, it's hot. You know, it's easy to say that we're not going to use much air conditioning if you're in San Francisco. I mean, you open the windows, and there's three days a year that gets above 85, and, you know, well, I'm sorry, we're gonna turn on the air condition down here, it's, it's hot. Second thing is that it's also easy to say that you, have, you use too much electricity for your industrial uh, processes if you're in a state that doesn't do manufacturing. Well, the South has a lot of manufacturing as part of its economic engine. That uses a different way. And we also have development patterns. If you're in the Northeast, your development pattern is really high density. If you're in the West, your development pattern is one city, 42 miles of nothing, one city. Well, that's not the way we developed in the South. We have lots of little cities built around the rivers and the textile mills, and so people do travel. So given all of those differences, the South has opportunities around biofuels in a big way. I mean, we have a lot of the feedstock and wood products and switchgrass and other things that we can do in the South. So there's a big biofuel upside that we could do. Uh, we have solar opportunities. It's not 100% like it is in the sa desert Southwest. But in the 80s, and the big problem there is there's humidity in the air, and that causes it not to be quite as good, but we're not getting rid of the humidity anytime soon either, and so we'll deal with that. So I think it'll be distributed. I think there's wind possibilities. Uh, you know, we'll have environmental issues. I, I know the fights are already on in North Carolina that we don't want any windmills in the mountains because it ruins the view, and maybe we should put them offshore, and if we put them offshore, then we have to worry about hurricanes. And So again, not easy choices, but the South, has to understand, and we're, and we're one of the places also that has uh, a strong nuclear presence. And we, we're gonna have another one of those great debates here on nuclear issues. I know it's a big deal in South Carolina. We're gonna have more. There are quite, both Duke, Progress, and the Southern companies are all talking about new nuclear. Uh, my wife and I were in Paris at a, at a conference, uh, mostly as a pleasure trip, but went to a conference a few weeks ago on energy and watched the French and the Germans just fight unbelievably on energy issues because the French are mostly nuclear and are going to build more and the Germans are completely anti-nuclear and they're right beside each other and you know they think they're part of the EU together and uh, but so these are not easy issues and if you're a coal state and you're West Virginia or, or Eastern Kentucky you've got lots of jobs that come into play so I don't think the answer is going to be uh, pick this and don't pick that I think what we're going to see is distributed answers with lots of different pieces moving forward at the same time. Well, Ted, before I let you go, I want to... A tiger paw. A tiger <laughs> paw, of course. On behalf of Clemson University and the Strom Thurmond Institute, we want to thank you for being here and look forward to a return trip. We'd love to come okay. down anytime. Thank you thank all. Thank you. Please and join me. I'll stay me up in. for a few minutes if anybody has questions. Sure. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.
thank you for coming this evening. And um, Ted Abernathy said that he would stay around for a few minutes if you have a, a, some questions for him. Just come on up front. Come on up front. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight.